Is Thomas here already? We have with us uh, Thomas Schreiner, yes, who is from Medaustron. In fact, he is uh, the director of non-clinical research at Medaustron. Um, Thomas, it is a real pleasure to have you with us. Uh, I'm not seeing you though on the camera. Are you here? Yes, I'm here. Ah, ah there you are. Um, uh, thank you for uh, your time and your uh, and you know giving us your time for. Um, this this uh, lecture series, um, we know how busy you are, and uh, without further ado, I will give you the floor to give us an overview of the Medaustron facility. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Nic Nicolas, uh, for giving me the opportunity to present now our facility. As we have discussed, uh, the presentation will be mainly a, a selection of some video clips, which has been performed for the last, it goes to the last topic already for the last flash therapy, which was actually in, in Vienna in December 2021. Uh, yeah, this uh, presentation or these video clips have, have been prepared due to the reason that there was not, it was not possible to visit the facility uh, personally. And we take the, the chance now to, to go at least to parts of this total video since we have a limited amount of time there. So I will motivate this in a few slides. So let me try to share. So let's start directly. So I think there were some colleagues already during the course from Midas Throne and, and you have received some information. So this is really then the, the, the basic information about what is Midas Throne and then we, we can go through the, the different video clips there. So actually, Medostron is a center for, of course, ion beam therapy and clinical research. So we have started the clinical operation in December 2016 with protons in one room. And this was then followed up uh, three years later. So it was in July 2019, where also carbon ions uh, have been delivered for the first time at Medostron for, uh, for a clinical uh, patient there. And in total, we have uh, three clinically used irradiation rooms. The last one with the gantry has been set into operation recently. So I think it was in the beginning of May. Uh, so currently all three clinical irradiation rooms with the different functionalities are now in operation. And since December, 2016, we have already treated more than 1,400 patients. And the current status is that we are about 500 patients per year. So the, the, the goal is to, to reach for this year 500 patients per year. And this number of patients per year should, of course, increase now with the opportunity to have all the three irradiation rooms in operation. But this is not only one part of the, of the whole story. So the second part, Medostron is also a center, how we call it, for non research. So also research is an important point here at Medostron. And this can be also described since we have right from the beginning and from the design phase, we have a, a dedicated irradiation room. So this means that in principle, we have here four um, irradiation rooms at Meadows Throne. And the first one is really dedicated for non-clinical research. You see also here a picture of this room. So this is not suited for patient treatment. And actually we have started with non-clinical research at Meadows Throne. Uh, two months before the clinical uh, treatment started. So we had our regular beam times for non-clinical research with protons since October 2016. And then two years later in September 2019, we had also carbon ions available at Medostron. And in addition to the clinical beam parameters, it is also uh, possible to provide 800 MeV protons, so a much higher uh, proton energy in comparison to the clinical ones can also be provided in IR1 for non-clinical research purposes. Another difference for the beam parameters uh, is that we can achieve much lower fluxes, so much lower intensities as they are required for clinical treatment. So normally you have 10 to the power of 10 protons per spill from coming from the synchrotron. And we can reduce this number to the to values around 10 to the power of three, so 1,000 or even 10,000 uh, protons per spill. And this has been required by some colleagues from, 
for doing some detector developments and, and stuff like that. So this is also possible only for research there. And what we have in addition here is for the, the, the researchers here is that we have a defined amount of beam time per year. And this can then be used in this non-clinical irradiation room by the different groups, which are coming mostly from our universities and of course research institutions. As you know, this uh, kind of facilities, uh, combined facilities providing protons and carbon ions is not so often uh, worldwide and Austria is a small country and that's, it's clear that this is unique in Austria. Uh, the facility is located in Wiener Neustadt and Wiener Neustadt is located in the east of Austria and it's about 40 kilometers south of Vienna. And as I have already said, we have, yeah, uh, several cooperations with universities and research institutions for research. So this was just a small teaser to that you know what, what is around. And as I've said, we have prepared for this flash radiotherapy and particle therapy conference in Vienna last year in December, uh, a video. And they have divided that video now in, in several sections. So I would propose to go through yeah, some of these sections there and then the video will stop and then we have maybe some time or the opportunity to, to, to have some questions or some discussions around and then we will see if we, we end up with this, what I have selected here, I think seven sections. Uh, what you have on the, on the homepage, I think, on, on this timetable, I've uploaded a, a PDF file where you can see also these links of the different uh, video clips and if you click on, on these links then you should go directly to this YouTube site and then you can see the different clips or you can also go directly to the total video and, and if you reserve some time then you can go through the whole video which is uh, yeah, one hour and, and, and a quarter something like that where the link is also provided here at the end of this uh, presentation there. Yeah some uh, some topics are already, already it's only half a year old, outdated. So we have already the last irradiation room for the clinical applications in operation. So the gantry room is already in operation. This was not the case in the in December 2021, but yeah, we will see this when we go through these videos. Uh, let's start again with some welcome introduction from our uh, our CIO. Sorry, uh, and yeah. Let's see if this is working. Uh, not the sound. Okay. Let's try. Six comparable centers worldwide. Okay, now can receive help okay. there with a very advanced and one of the least available therapies in the world ion or particle therapy. This form of radiation therapy uses charged particles, protons, or carbon ions to treat tumors. These particles are generated with a particle accelerator, which was developed and built in cooperation with the European Laboratory for Particle Physics, CERN. In addition to clinical applications, MedOstron also conducts research to improve the therapy method and generate more evidence. The Ion Treatment Center has been in operation since December 2016. Welcome members of FRPT 2021. We welcome you here at the Medaustron Ion Therapy Center. We would have wished to welcome you in person and have you all around and give you the tour, but given the circumstances, we'll just do it online. Uh, well, the Medaustron uh, Ion Therapy Center uh, opens the doors uh, in December 2016 when we treated the first patient with protons. Uh, since July of 2019, we have started the carbon ion therapy uh, treatment. 
We are one of only six centers uh, presently who actually have this uh, dual capability of protons and carbon ions. And as you probably know, we do have also the potential of research uh, other particles in the future. So by now we have treated around 1,200 patients. Uh, we are a center that focuses uh, very much on studies uh, and more than 90% of all of our patients um, participate in a registry study. As such, we have uh, several large patient groups. Uh, we treat many children. Uh, we treat many CNS, head and neck uh, tumor patients. Uh, but also, and in particular for carbon ion therapy, uh, explore the uh, additional um, indications beyond the established indications. We have a great emphasis on uh, technological innovation, uh, and that is actually the focus of this tour. Uh, so, we hope you'll enjoy that tour that we put together for you. We hope you enjoy the remainder of the conference, and all the best to you. Goodbye. Welcome to Medaustron. We are an outpatient center for tumor patients and we are in operation for now uh, nearly five years. Besides patient treatment, our focal points are research, on the one hand clinical research, on the other hand non-clinical research, and to carry out technical projects for third parties. So welcome again and enjoy the tour of our facility. Okay. So I think for the introduction, which was more or less a summary of what I have already presented. And as I've said, yes, the video was, uh, was done for, for this conference there and therefore some dates are already outdated there. So let's continue with the, with the technical part with the injector hole. So which means that from the accelerator point of view, we start of course from the sources, from the ion sources, then we are going to the linear accelerator and then to the synchrotron hole, synchrotron hole and then of course to the irradiation room. So the, the normal sequence uh, of such a facility there. In the injector hall, the first part of the particle accelerator, the ion sources are located. This is the origin of our beam. There are three ion sources installed at MedAustron, and each source is dedicated for a certain ion beam species. Source 1 is dedicated for the proton generation and Source 2 for carbon ion beam generation. The third source is under commissioning and it is tuned to generate a helium beam. How is the source set up? The sources run all in parallel. They are basically never stopped. They run continuously 24 over 24 hours, except when there is a maintenance slot. Then we stop the source and we do certain work on it. The source uh, set point, so the beam that we extract from the source, uh, comes from a multi-parameter scan. So we have a different uh, type of parameters that we need to set up to get the proper beam. We create in the ion source a state of plasma. We can think about the sun because in the sun we, have, we also have a plasma state. So it's the same thing, it's the fourth state of matter. So we have this plasma which is magnetically confined within the plasma chamber, within the ion source. And once the plasma is formed by an RF uh, electromagnetic wave, we can then extract the ions from it. And from these ions, we create our beam. What are the key factors for a good clinical beam from the source point of view? Of course, the key factor for us, as I mentioned before, is to have a proper stable beam and due also to the fact that the beam is never stopped source-wise. So what we basically need to make sure is that the current that we deliver from the source has always the same nominal intensity and also in terms of emittance. So the beam in the phase space needs to be constant and reproducible. And for this reason, we always do daily checks of, the, of our current. So if the current at the source level is stable and monthly, we also measure other um, source parameters, like for example, the emittance in the phase space, the position of the beam once it's extracted from the ion source, because these of course are all key factors 
to then uh, get a proper transmission of the beam from the ion source to the next stage of the accelerator that is the LINAC. How do you guarantee this stability? Basically uh, on a monthly basis and then also every six months and year on a yearly basis we do certain maintenance activity on the source. We basically check all components, we check uh, some parts and replace some of these parts and by this basically we assure that our beam is stably produced from the ion source. The stability of the source is guaranteed by maintenance activities. This also includes regular readjustment of the source set point, which comes from the multi-parameter scan, which we mentioned before. How does the beam generated from the source affect the rest of the accelerator performance? Once the beam is generated at the ion source level, we need to make sure that it's properly transported in the fur further downstream, so in the further um, section of the accelerator. So as I mentioned before, we need to make sure that our beam is properly transported from the source to the first part of the linear accelerator, which is the so-called radio frequency quadrupole. If we have, for example, uh, a drop of intensity at the source level because the beam gets unstable we can see this effect up to the room because less particle will be delivered into the room and that means that we will have a less uh, intense beam basically up to the room so this is why it's very crucial to keep the source performance stable and to have a stable intensity the beam is transported from the source to the radio frequency quadrupole via a low energy beam line. The extracted beam from the source is 8 kilo electron volt per nucleon for protons and carbon ions and 12 kilo electron volt per nucleon for helium ion beams. The beam is transported through the low energy beam transfer line to the linear accelerator section. What are future development plans? Currently at uh, Medaustron, two sources are used for clinical treatment. The S1 is used for protons, as I mentioned before, and the S2 is used with carbon ion beams. And, but we also have a third source branch where we can produce other beam species because these th three sources are all identical within each other, but the S3 is not yet a medical ion source. And therefore we used it in the past months to do certain test activity, to test uh, some spare parts, but also to produce other ion beams. And since, since helium can be a future uh, beam for clinical treatment as well, the plan is to commission S3 with helium ion beams. Yes, so actually in the meantime, we have already commissioned the third ion source for helium ions. So the source itself is already commissioned. Also, the low energy beam transport line, which you have seen in the, in the last video clip, is already commissioned and we have achieved already also the beam going through the two linear particle accelerators, which means that we, have, we are now starting with the commissioning in the medium energy beam transport line. So there was quite a lot of effort doing that in the last uh, six, eight months, but we are really going forward with this helium ion commissioning at Metastrom. So let's continue with the next part of the accelerator chain there. Once the particles are produced in the injector hull, the beam is bunched and accelerated in the linear particle accelerator. This means the first acceleration takes place in the linear particle accelerator. This needs to happen as the beam that is generated from the ion sources does not have enough energy to treat cancer patients. The second acceleration takes part in the synchrotron. What does mainly happen in the bunker? In the bunker, the first stage of beam acceleration takes place by means of linear accelerators, in particular the RFQ, the radio frequency quadrupole and the drift tube LINAC. And we need to do that because the beam that comes out from the ion source does not have enough energy for the cancer treatment. So we need to increase this energy up to 61% of the speed of light. And at Medaustron, this happens in two stages. 
one in the linear accelerator and the other then in the synchrotron. Why do we need a multi-stage acceleration? We need it because it's much more efficient and at the end we will get a much better beam quality if the acceleration takes place in several devices instead a unique accelerator that has to cover a broader range of radio frequency, uh, electric field and magnetic field. How does the acceleration with radio frequency waves work? A charged particles get accelerated by means of an electric field. In a radio frequency accelerator, a time-varying electric field interacts with the beam and accelerate it. The beam needs to be bunched, so made by small uh, packages of particles. And when there is a, a synchronism between the uh, radio frequency wave, the electric field, and the, the beam, then the, uh, this packet, these bunches, get accelerated all over the, the linear accelerator. The buncher is a radio frequency pillbox cavity, which enhances the bunching process of the beam started in the radio frequency quadrupole. No further acceleration is provided to the beam. Overall, the IMS helps to optimize the beam injection into the drift tube linic and overall performance. What is a radio frequency quadrupole? It's the first uh, component of the linear accelerator chain it's, uh, uh, it has mainly the function to prepare the beam that comes from the ion source and make it available for injection in the drift tube linac. It has three functions. It keeps the beam focused in the beam pipe. Uh, it accelerates it and make it from continuous beam as in the source into this uh, small packet in bunches. How does the radio frequency quadrupole work? Inside the RFQ, there are four structures, namely road or veins, and they uh, create an electric quadrupole that keeps the beam focused. This structure have a longitudinal modulation that at the same time allow the beam to be accelerated and bunched. The acceleration from the RFQ is just minor with respect to all the others because we bring the beam from 8 kV per nucleon, so 0.4% of flight to 3% speed of flight. That is the energy required to be injected into the drift tube linac. What does the intertank matching section do? The beam extracting from the RFQ is not yet prepared for being injected into the drift tube linac. There is a structure in between the RFQ and the LINAC that is called intertank matching section that contains two quadruple doublet and RF cavity. The goal of this section is to improve the beam from the RFQ and match it with the requirement of the LINAC. What is the IH tank? The IH tank, also known as drift tube LINAC, is a linear accelerator where the main acceleration takes place. It accelerates the beam from 3% of speed of light, 400 kV per nucleon, till 7 MeV uh, per nucleon, which is the energy required for the injection into the, the synchrotron. The LINAC is made by a drift tube and accelerating gap. When the beam enters into the drift tube LINAC inside the tube, it does not feel any electric field, while in the accelerating gap, in the gap between the tubes, it feels an electric field and gain energy if the bunch is synchronized perfectly with the electric field. With the increasing of the particle velocity, the length of the drift tube increases as well. In our case, the drift tube LINAC contains 52 tubes that goes from 1 to 6.5 cm. The last element in the bunker is a stripping foil, which is a thin foil of carbon, and the goal is to remove the electrons around the ion species that have been generated by the ion source and create the uh, particles, namely protons and carbon-6, that will be delivered to the patient. What is the debuncher? The last RF cavity in the injector uh, session is the debuncher that is in the, uh, in the synchrotron hole and that's the purpose to adjust the beam coming from the injector and make it available for the injection into the synchrotron. It adjusts the longitudinal properties of the beam in order to uh, efficiently get in injected into the synchrotron. Yeah, so what we have seen now is how we call this the injector, which is the, or which are the ion sources, plus these two kind of uh, linear accelerators. 
And what has been mentioned there is this stripping foil, and this is needed because we are accelerating on the one hand from the sources up to the stripping foil, not only sing not single protons, but H3 plus ions. So we have a charge to mass ratio of one over three. And for the carbon ions, we have C4 plus, which means that we have also for them a charge to mass ratio of one over three. This means that for the whole injector chain, the accelerator sees the same kind of particles in that sense that they have the same uh, charge to mass ratio there. And this made it quite difficult for the helium ions because for the helium ions, we have a different charge to mass ratio because we have one over two. And therefore we have different settings for the, for the injector chain, mainly for the linear accelerators. But as I've said, we have finally su succeeded there and we have quite a good transmi transmission and we are already at the end of the second linear accelerator and we are already commissioning the medium energy beam transport line. But this was just a side remark to the current activities which are done here at Metastron. And as, 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 have, as it has been said, after the, the injector, uh, the main uh, acceleration takes place and, and for that we have the synchrotron, the, the circular accelerator in our facility there. Once the beam is injected into the synchrotron, the beam reaches a speed up to two thirds of the speed of light. The particles stay in the synchrotron for just a few seconds, which is sufficient for them to complete several millions of turns in the ring. Magnets keep the beam on the nominal orbit. The strength of the magnets is increased with the energy of the beam, meaning everything needs to be perfectly synchronized. That is also where the name synchrotron stems from. Then, the beam is slowly peeled off into the extraction line. This happens in a very controlled manner, and that is when the beam can be used for treating patients. The rotator is a new concept that was introduced at MedOstron for the first time worldwide. It rotates synchronized with the gantry and ensures a smooth transition of beam properties and control between the static accelerator and the moving gantry elements. This means there can be different angles commissioned. What is a synchrotron and how does it work? So the uh, injector, uh, which is the section upstream of the synchrotron, accelerate the particles uh, to a medium energy. Then uh, the beam is injected into the synchrotron and uh, uh, the energy gets up to very high uh, values. Energy. So the core of the acceleration in the synchrotron is a vacuum chamber called the RF cavity, radio frequency cavity, that uh, accelerate the beam up to 70% of the speed of light. The particle uh, stays in the ring for millions of turns, and this cavity uh, give a kick at the particle at each turn. So to keep the beam into the uh, position, into the orbit, we use magnets in the synchrotron. Very strong magnets confine the beam to uh, a central orbit and uh, the strength of the magnets needs to increase as the energy of the particle increase. So as to be synchronized uh, uh, to the energy of the particle and that's why it's called synchrotron because everything has to be synchronized. The acceleration, the energy, the magnetic field of all the quadruples and uh, dipoles in the ring and, uh, and the particles. And uh, the synchrotron of Medaustron can accelerate uh, um, very different species of particles like protons, carbon ions, and in the near future also helium. Once the beam reaches the high energy, uh, we have a very high quality beam with the wanted energy, which is ready for uh, to being extracted from the synchrotron. How do you extract the beam from the synchrotron? The synchrotron is circulating the beam at approximately up to two thirds the speed of light. And as for slow extraction, what you would like to do is slowly peel the beam off so that you're then extracting the beam slowly over several seconds into the extraction line. 
as you extract the bean, you want to set up the conditions so that the bean isn't all extracted at once, but then you have a something called a betatron core that does a small push on the bean to then move it towards the resonance conditions. These resonance conditions then allow the beam to be peeled off so that then when the using some of the special magnets like the sext pole, the resonance sext pole, you can then um, take the beam and so that it's in the right position for the um, electrostatic scepter to then sort of pull the beam off and pull it into the extraction channel. During this uh, maneuver, you're then slowly extracting the beam while stably holding the beam orbiting because the beam will still perform in less than half a second over a million turns and you want to be able to slowly pull this beam off in a very controlled and very um, reliable and reproducible manner so that then it can be used for the uh, treatment of the patients. So one of the advantages of the synchrotron is that this extraction can be performed over for once you've reached any energy, so once it's been accelerated up to any energy and with the different types of particles, you can then extract those particles off regardless of the, the energy, the final energy or the type of particle that's being used. What is the high energy beam transfer line? The high energy beam transfer line is after the beam has been extracted, it's separated off into the transfer line that then is a series of vacuum tubes and vacuum lines with uh, magnets following along it that then um, are used to move the beam and control the, in a controlled manner down towards the treatment rooms. The, um, as the beam transfers down this, uh, the, the habit or the high energy beam transfer line, it then um, go, first goes through um, something called a chopper. This chopper is a magnetic chicane that means that the beam is only, it's only switched on and it's only allowed to go around the beam dump once this has been uh, requested and switched on. So that way your, your first stage is making sure that the only, the, the good quality parts of the beam are being extracted and sent to the room so that the head and the tail of the beam and the, is uh, removed and only the middle good quality part is being uh, transmitted down the transfer line. Uh, the next part of it is you have a series of special magnets things like the phase step shifter, which is a series of quadrupole magnets to, to manipulate and change the beam um, from being uh, the shape it is as it's extracted through to a shape that can be worked and used with for um, extraction into the irradiation rooms. The, um, so you have along the beam line also other quadrupoles, correctors and dipoles to navigate and direct the beam along the signs you're being transferred line into the different treatment rooms. Once you've reached the end of one of these uh, transfer lines into one of the treatment rooms, you then have a, a scanning magnet. The scanning magnet is then used to deliver that energy slice over a predefined uh, shape that is part of the prescribed dose that's being delivered to the patient. And then you also have, um, as the final checks, you have a um, the dose delivery system, like the dose delivery monitors and the intensity monitors to make sure that the beam meets the requirements that are being requested for delivery to the treatment room. What is the rotator? So the task of the rotator is to rotate the beam in the phase space in preparation for the gantry beam line. So the, uh, the rotator is a new concept and uh, we designed it, installed it, and verified that it's uh, uh, working, tested, and verified its functionality, and it works. Yeah, so we have quite a lot of information about our synchrotron and the different elements and how some parts are working there. And we have already seen the high energy beam transport line. And from these high energy beam transport lines, the the beam is then directed into the different irradiation rooms. And as I've said in the beginning, we have four irradiation rooms at Metastron with different functionalities, which means that different beam lines, uh, fixed beam lines, and, and also this gantry beam line. And of course, we have also our non clinical irradiation room. And there is also one contribution for the gantry. I have to say that, yes, the gantry is already in operation. They are every day patients treated with this beam line. So this concept with this rotator in the beam line and the gantry itself in the room is working and is 
in operation since uh, yeah since the end of of April this year. A proton gantry is a device that can bring an ionizing radiation beam towards a patient under a particular angle that you can choose. At MedOstron, the gantry can technically deliver beam between 180, above below, and zero degrees, bottom below, to the patient. The clear advantages in comparison to a horizontally and vertically fixed beam line are that the positioning of patients can be simplified in some cases and that healthy tissue can be spared even better, leading to a minimized risk of side effects. What is a gantry? A yeah, gantry in radiotherapy in general is a device that is uh, intended to bring an ionizing radiation beam uh, towards a patient under a particular angle that you can choose as a user. You normally have a rotating structure that is uh, then bringing this beam towards the patient that exists in classical uh, radiotherapy, so with X-ray beams, but also in particle therapy uh, like we have it here uh, with, with proton beams. So a proton gantry, like the one here at, at Middlestrom, is basically designed to uh, choose an angle of inclination of that particle beam. In our case here, it's between 180 and zero degrees. So you have uh, from the vertical direction to the horizontal direction, and then from the other vertical direction, uh, the possibility to, uh, to bring that beam towards the patient. What is the advantage of a gantry? The gantry in general has a huge advantage because it allows that you can choose, you have more degrees of freedom than in a fixed beam line. So in particle therapy you often have fixed beam lines, so horizontal or vertical where the, the beam is practically always entering a patient from one particular direction and the gantry allows you to choose angles in between. Why is that important? Because um, it allows you to spare uh, tissue and it's all about let's say the side effects that you want to minimize so uh, to spare healthy tissue just to hit also with uh, your entrance channel uh, no critical structure so uh, especially radiosensitive organs for example uh, you want to avoid uh, that they basically get also some dose. Which patients can be treated with the gantry? Actually, it's uh, a variety of um, indications that are suitable uh, to be treated um, and um, where, where there is a special advantage, for example, is for, for children. It is uh, um, uh, typically uh, here and, and intended, but also there are certain indications where you simply want to avoid that you enter, for example, via a perfectly um, vertical beam, but you want to have some degrees and for exactly that uh, you have the possibility to use then the, the gantry room. Compared to the rooms with fixed beam lines, how big was the effort for the gantry room? Yeah, the effort is actually pretty large if you compare it as, uh, to, the, to the fixed beam lines because uh, one needs to imagine that um, in particle therapy you have to practically um, move the whole equipment. So the whole beam line consisting of vacuum equipment, magnets uh, <coughs> and, and a lot of heavy material uh, you have to move that uh, around in order to allow that. So it's, it's actually a fairly cost-intensive uh, method, but uh, at the same time uh, you have the advantages for, for the patients which, which make it worth it. In the particular case of the uh, gantry here at Medostron, for example, just to give an, a, a feeling, um, we are talking about around 220 tons uh, of uh, mass that are actually used to rotate the whole beam line around the patient. But of course, what is very important is that in the environment here, the patient actually should see as little as possible from all these efforts. What are the challenges in building such a structure? The challenges um, for especially getting such a room into operation as compared to fixed beam line are um, are pretty large also because of um, the, the masses that I mentioned uh, that have to be moved. So these uh, heavy, he heavy weights, now for example, the um, 
the last dipole on that beam line that is there to bend the iron beam by 90 degree directly then onto the patient. It weighs around 50, 60 tons. And uh, this needs to be moved in such a way that you still maintain a precision of your iron beam of about 0.1 millimeter. And that is from the mechanical construction uh, pretty much challenging but also means a lot for then uh, the way how you get it in operation. So there are other difficulties related to this precision. Um, practically, if you think about um, measuring now where your iron beam will be and to put all these settings into the accelerator, um, you need to do a lot of uh, things and you depend on being able to measure this point. And also that turns out to be way more difficult as in a fixed beamline, for example, because uh, there are simply less possibilities. Uh, you can see um, that the room is structured differently. You have rolling floors. You do not have so many fixed walls. Uh, and uh, that, that makes, uh, makes it very difficult actually to, um, to access this, uh, this precision. Practically all this room here where we stand on is based on a steel structure uh, and that of course brings with it certain complications regarding vibrations especially uh, as compared to the concrete as you normally have it. Also during the treatment everything is high precision and depending on no movements at all. Um, this, is, this is especially demanding here with this steel structure. And of course, one also needs to consider is that the, uh, the height simply inside the technical area due to the fact that the whole beam line is moving around is pretty high. No? We are more than 10 meters. Uh, so also questions of occupational safety play a different role that you simply don't have in the fixed beam line rooms. Are there any new concepts compared to the fixed beam lines? Yeah, actually, as compared to the fixed beam lines, we have a couple of new concepts here in the, uh, in the gantry room, for example. Um, due to the fact that the uh, patient in this room, because you move the beam line around, will be treated with, we say, isocentric. So the patient stays there and you move the beam around. Um, you need to um, have the possibility to bring some of these what we call passive elements uh, towards the patient. And for that, uh, this is a, let's say, a mechanical structure called a snout that moves then these elements towards the patient. This is one of the differences uh, as compared to the, uh, to the fixed beam lines. And there are others like, for example, um, because of the fact that you have a, a rolling floor, so you do not have accessible walls to show the laser indicators that you normally have. So typically uh, one uh, orients himself inside the room with the help of laser lines that are uh, printed from the walls. And this is actually more complicated in the gantry room because you simply have a moving structure that blocks your field of view. So also for that, there were some concepts introduced to have lasers moving with the mechanical structure um, with all disadvantages and, and complexity that this brings with it. And uh, last but not least, there is uh, also the, um, the beam optics itself. So practically one can always think about an iron beam like in classical optics where you have a light. You can practically uh, think about the iron beam like this beam of light and you use lenses and uh, other elements to steer your iron beam, um, like with mirrors in conventional optics. And also this optical setup, um, you want to have that as little as possible dependent on the gantry angle so that if you then add um, and, uh, angles for the, for the clinical user in the future, um, you have less effort basically to commission all that. So practically you want to have a beam optics that is uh, independent of your gantry angle. And uh, there were special concepts, actually, it's a complete uh, novel concept here, uh, first time in the world actually applied um, at Metastron with the rotator, a structure that actually helps in combination with the gantry to be, uh, let's say, independent of that gantry angle regarding the, the beam shape and its properties. 
Yeah. And that's also the reason why we have just only a proton gantry. So the, this our gantry here at Metastron can only deliver protons and not carbon ions. And, and the, the reason for that is simply that the magnetic beam rigidity for carbon ions is a, about a factor of three higher. And if you have just heard the, the, the numbers or the figures for the dimensions and the weight uh, for the protons, and then if you would then imagine to have magnetic beam rigidity, which is a factor of three higher, then you can imagine how large uh, such a carbon ion gantry can be. So there is one already realized in, in Germany at the uh, Heidelberg Ion Beam Therapy Center. And I think the, the weight for this carbon ion gantry is about 600 tons. So this is, uh, we have already a large device, but this is even much, much larger. And, and therefore we had decided to build just this proton gantry there. So, I would propose to, to continue now with uh, the last technical part here with this accelerator control room, and then maybe to, to go to some discussions if there is any. But as I've said, you, the, the, the clips are available and, and you can also have them a look afterwards or whenever you have time to go through these different clips and, and, and have a look to that. So let's continue here with this one. The accelerator is operated 24-7. During the week, from about 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., the accelerator is used for clinical treatment. Outside of these times, the accelerator is used for quality assurance, development activities, commissioning, and non-clinical research. The clinical beams are triggered by medical staff from local control rooms, each one responsible for one irradiation room. During other activities outside of the clinical operation, the accelerator is operated from the ACR via the Accelerated Control System, MAX. It distributes all configuration parameters and relevant commands to all components, manages the synchronization of all elements via a precise timings system, and thus drives the beam formation, injection, acceleration, and extraction processes. What is the purpose of the accelerator control room? The purpose of the accelerator control room is basically to have an overview on the machine and um, also an overview on the machine operation. We have several means here for that. Uh, so the accelerator control system here in the background, which is used not only to monitor, but really to assess all accelerator components and systems. Then we have other means here, for instance, a panel for the machine protection system. Uh, we have access to the patient protection system as well. We have get an overview or have an overview on the, um, on the IT infrastructure, on the technical infrastructure, and also on the radiation levels inside the accelerator. So all this information is available here in the accelerator control room and is used in the operation of the accelerator. What is the accelerator control system? The accelerator control system can be understood basically as the heart and the brain of the accelerator. So the um, accelerator control system, internally we call it MAX, Meta Austrian Accelerator Control System, is synchronizing all components, is communicating with all components of the accelerator generally, um, monitors the component status drives the beam formation process, including the, let's say, beam production, beam injection into the synchrotron, um, acceleration and also the extraction and then the transport of the beam um, to the treatment rooms. And it also interfaces with the um, machine protection system and also with the patient protection system. So there is a lot of information flow from the components to the components uh, via the control system to the patient protection system um, from the machine protection system and so on and so forth. What can we see on the panels behind you? The accelerator control system provides user interfaces, so basically panels. Um, there's uh, panels per component of component group um, where the properties of this component group can be accessed and also the settings of the of individual components or components as a whole um, be adapted and controlled. So we have for all accelerator components, um, we have panels. We have panels for the ion sources. We have panels for the linear accelerator. We have panels for the magnets and power converters, for the beam diagnostic devices, etc., etc. So for all, except for all components, 
that are comprising the accelerator, we have a panel where we can assess the status, um, check the configuration, um, can do monitoring of the component and so on and so forth. So it's really the whole accelerator is visible via Max and the, also the status of the components. What is the purpose of the patient protection and machine protection system? So there are two aspects here. Um, the accelerator as a whole um, has to have a machine protection system um, in order to avoid uh, that one of the components of the accelerator um, sustains a, a substantial damage during operation. For example, we have a magnet and um, our magnets are, the majority of our magnets are water-cooled. And um, assuming we have a lack of cooling water um, for whatever reason, um, maybe because uh, the, the cooling pipe is clogged and, and the water flow is reduced, then this machine, machine protection system um, detects it and avoids that the magnet can be operated uh, without the required cooling. Um, this protects the magnet uh, from heating up excessively and effectively getting damaged because of that. So this, this is the purpose of the machine protection system. So the machine protection system, um, which we call um, BIS or beam interlock system, is looking only at the machine. Then we have the patient protection system and the patient protection system assures that the patient safety is given um, during irradiation of the patient. What does this mean? Um, the patient protection system looks First of all, of course, at the beam properties, it checks the beam energy, beam intensity, it checks the beam shape and the beam position. Secondly, um, the patient safety system also is looking at the data integrity. So it checks that the data that are used for the um, patient treatment are really those that are supposed to be used and are not corrupted. And third, it checks also the um, integrity and the functionality of all the safety systems and the whole safety chain. So this is the patient protection system. It's really, this is the means that we use and we have to use during patient treatment in order to assure that uh, the patients that are treated are getting the treatment that they need and are treated safely. Are there different operating modes for the accelerator? So we have two options. We can operate the um, accelerator either from the accelerator control system, so from the accelerator control room, and the second option is that we operate the accelerator from the local control room, such as the um, as it is done during clinical treatments. Um, however, we can operate from the local control rooms also for other purposes, for instance, for doing quality assurance measurements and also for um, specific, let's say, commissioning activities. Uh, tests and checks of the patient safety system. This we do uh, regular, uh, regularly and routinely from the local control rooms. The accelerator control room operation provides more freedom. So when we operate the machine from the local control room, we are restricted to some extent by the patient safety system. Um, we have more degrees of freedom when we operate from the accelerator control room where we can select single beams, single beams with single energies basically on the fly. Um, when we operate from the local control room, we have to use treatment plans as in clinical operation, as for patient treatments, but uh, for instance, specific ones uh, for the tests that we want to execute. There we are limited to the machine settings and beam settings that uh, the treatment plans are um, comprising. The major difference between operation from the local control room and the accelerator control room is that in the one case, so when operating from the local control room, the patient protection system is activated, whereas the patient protection system is deactivated when we're operating MAPTA from the accelerator control room. This means also that we cannot operate, we must not operate uh, MAPTA from the accelerator control room for patient treatment because otherwise the safety of the patients would not be given. Who operate? So I wanted to stop here, maybe to don't go too long because it's then lunchtime. And of course, we want to give you the opportunity to, to have at least a short discussion or some, some questions there. 
No joke. Yeah, go to the board. If there's any questions from the student, please raise your hand or type something into the chat box and we'll read them out. So there we have a question from Mateo. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, so one question is, why did you choose the idea of using a rotator in the gantry and not use a, for example, a standard gantry, which could be used from a vendor? Was it really to invent something new, do research, and uh, probably apply this to a carbon gantry? Or was it just, yeah, what was the, the idea behind it? So the idea world was, of course, this is, was in principle a theoretical concept at the beginning, and it was designed like that. And in principle, this has nothing to do with the with the gantry itself. So there are just the, the elements there, but you can also rotate more or less or take this concept also for, for other gantries. Yeah? The, the principal idea is that you have really identical beam parameters, so optical beam parameters at the gantry for each angle at this was at this, at this, at this was described and that the commissioning effort afterwards is much reduced. Uh, so the idea is here that for the gantry angle you have half the angle rotation for this rotator and if you do like that then you have always the identical uh, geometry of, of the beam size there. So this was actually the idea and it, it was designed like that and we are we have then also tried to, to realize that yeah, in such a way. But of course, you can also operate a say, normal gantry with normally, so there's from the output, there's no difference. Yeah. And of course, it was a bit of a challenge, and, and yeah, we have succeeded <laughs> to bring this in operation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Then the, the, the question afterwards so, did it reduce the the time you need for the commissioning? Was yeah, it, so we have, it, yeah, actually we have, we have started with, uh, so it is already in operation, but this means doesn't mean that we have commissioned all the angles which we want to have. Yeah? So we have currently, I think, three ang ang angles uh, uh, commissioned. So there is quite a lot of additional things to do. So we will have, uh, we want to have uh, additional ones. And for that, yes, the idea is that, that we can do this now much faster having this uh, possibility with this data there, yes. But this will come then up in the next in the next months, yes. Thank you very much. So there is, or there was, oh, okay. Uh, I have a, a question for myself here. You mentioned, mentioned at the start about the helium ions. What's the sort of time scale for the implementation of that? Or is there, what are the next steps for the sort of route to implementing it at Medostrom? Sorry, uh, you mean what, what are the next steps, what we want to implement at Midostron or? Uh, yeah, and to do with the, the helium ions and if uh, the, yeah. what's the sort of foreseeable time scale for that to be implemented. Yeah, yeah. so actually what, what we have now, so we have this uh, operation here at Midostron from Monday to Friday, from the morning to the evening for, for patient treatment. And then we have also uh, been them reserved for, for non-clinical research, which also increases which means on the other side that the, the beam line, which is available for further commissioning or further features of the, of the facility or the experiment itself is somehow limited. And this also, of course, uh, is, um, yeah, is, can, can be seen then in the times which are needed for having, for example, helium ions commissioned uh, until the irradiation room. And the current plan foreseems now that we are now at the medium energy beam transport line, which will then go until the end of the year. And for the next year, we will have then time for commissioning the, the helium ions in the synchrotron. And then we will have time that the upcoming year, so this means 24, to have then helium ions hopefully in the non clinical irradiation room first. So this is more or less the, the, the time scale. To, to prepare the heliums at least in the first step or in the first approach in the non-clinical irradiation room. And then of course, there's also the idea to, to use them clinically, but for, for, for using uh, this new kind of, of ion species in a, in a clinical way, the effort is even increased. So you have to do, of course, more commissioning work also from the medical physics point of view to have really a safe operation with this new ion species there. Yeah. So yeah, we are speaking here about years. 
Yeah, thank you. So, any more questions from anyone? Can't, can't see any more, and there isn't any in the, the Slack channel. So. so, Thomas, thank you so much for um, this session. It was very interesting. I love the overview um, of, um, um, of Medalstron. Thank you so much for your time. Um, um, okay, now we, we stop here for a short lunch break.